Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor here back. Very, very excited about today's show because we have one of the premier podcasters in the world joining us, a licensed nutritionist with a master's in science in human nutrition, a speaker with the Macmillan Speakers Bureau, a blogger on the Huffington Post, a, a popular author, someone who, who actually has a, uh, a singing career as well. Maybe we can get into that a little bit. Otherwise known as the Nutrition Diva on social media and on iTunes. Ladies and gentlemen, we have none other than Ms. Monica Renegal. Monica, welcome to the show. Wow, Jonathan, that's quite an introduction. I almost expect to hear the, you know, the applause sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the applause meter when you need it? I'm looking around, wondering who you're describing. I guess it's me. <laughs> well, Monica, I wanted to uh, give uh, that that introduction not only because you deserve it, but also because uh, one thing I've really enjoyed about your work and about our previous conversations is about this 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 concept and your brand does this so well of of health not being a burden but rather health being a blessing health being something that can be simple and health being something that can be empowering and helping us to communicate the message of health uh, uh, not not less so to the one percent that already get it but making it accessible and fun for the ninety nine percent who really really need it. Well, you know, there's so much to talk about, and I feel like no matter where you are entering the conversation, um, there's something that can inspire you, that can, you know, motivate you to make better choices, and that, um, yeah, I love that idea. And Jonathan, you and I have talked about this before offline, um, about that idea of extending the conversation to include people who might not wake up in the morning thinking about, you know, how many grams of fiber they're going to have for breakfast, but <laughs> could really benefit, you know, from... Um, from getting excited, a little bit more excited about nutrition and food choices. Well, and Monica, one thing that I think you can add such great insight to because you are a content powerhouse, meaning like folks, if, if I would highly recommend checking out Monica's website over at nutritionovereasy.com. Uh, she has a literally, well, it's like a freaking encyclopedia Britannica. And, and in order to, in some ways, keep the mill churning, to keep coming up with interesting information about nutrition, sometimes we, we have to talk about isolated things like fiber or in, intermittent fasting or this or that or this supplement. And, and sometimes that that can make it seem like this is a complicated thing, but but in reality, it's really not that complicated, but if it's not complicated, in some ways we run out of content to cover. So there's a bit of a paradox there. How do we, how do we, how do we cross that chasm or bridge that gap? Well, you know, I think that there's a, an interesting principle that applies here. Maybe you're familiar with it. It's called the Pareto principle, and um, it applies to a lot of different things, but in this context, it means that often you get about 80% of the benefit from the first 20% of the effort. And I feel like when people start to um, try to make changes to their diet, it's that first, um, that first effort produces enormous results. And then if they get hooked and they want to go further, well, yes, they can continue um, drilling down and getting you know, more and more specific uh, and incrementally you know, improving their nutrition status. But I think it's that first step that in some ways is the most important. So there's, um, uh, yeah, I do get, um, I can be a little bit of a nutrition wonk. I get interested in these really kind of esoteric questions that people bring up um, just from a point of scientific curiosity. I, I'm interested in learning how the body works, how our bodies interact with food and the environment and, you know, and all of that. Uh, but yeah, it, I think it's great to always kind of come back to that it's the basics that make the biggest difference. It, you know, just really simple things that everybody can focus on, like, um, oh, I'm, I sometimes get teased because I'm always telling people to eat their vegetables, which seems like such a frumpy old thing that your grandmother would say. But I really feel like if you were going to focus on one thing, one or two things, that would certainly be one of them just by, you know, making an effort to eat four or five servings of vegetables every day, all kinds of great things cascade from that without you having to know the name of every individual antioxidant in those <laughs> vegetables. Absolutely, Monica. I love that that concept of the Pareto principle, or sometimes I, I refer to it as big versus small levers. Like, will taking supplement X or powder Y help you? Maybe that's a really small lever. <laughs> will eating 
more vegetables help you? Yes. And that's a gigantic lever, like the, the, the amount of effort, the, the, the return on investment there or for getting better sleep or for drinking more water or just simply ensuring uh, you're getting a, a more nutrient dense uh, intake of foods. Those levers, those are the big levers, right? Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, so it's for those of us who spend our lives talking about nutrition and going down these little rabbit holes, oh, you know, is the oxalic acid in my green tea interfering with iron absorption? Like, okay, back up a second. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, they're, they're, uh, it's all part of the larger conversation. But as you and I have chatted before, Jonathan, I think that um, we want to be sure that we're continuing to reach out to people who aren't already, you know, it's easy to preach to the choir. And if we're really, when you talk about uh, levers, you know, there's levers in our individual lives and bodies, but then there's also levers on the population level. And if we're looking to move the levers on public health, then, yeah, we need to make sure that we're spending a lot of our energy reaching out to folks who are still eating 10 or 12 times a week in fast food restaurants and helping them help make it uh, imaginable for them to make a shift in that pattern. Well, and Monica, in terms of how how we can do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna and I'm gonna fall back into what limited formal training I have in this world, and that is a degree in economics. And the again, I'm an economist at heart, kind of. I'm a lot of different things at heart, but but in some ways, I feel that you know, eating at a fast food restaurant, for example, the day that a nutrient dense, delicious meal is less expensive than a hamburger and fries is the day this becomes widely adopted. And it also seems like people say, well, that's just not possible. Well, it is, right? Our government does things, and I don't want to turn this into a conspiracy conversation. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's a fact. We subsidize the production of certain plants and, and certain animals and not of other plants and animals. Uh, what do you think are the, the policy-wide food regulation changes that could be made to help make eating nutrient-dense whole foods easier and more mainstream? Well, I think that cost is definitely a factor. And, you know, people are going to, uh, especially people that don't have a lot of money to spend on food, um, they're going to be looking for the most calories for the fewest dollars, you know. But I, but I think that in your um, sort of fantasy world where that uh, nutrient-dense meal at McDonald's is, you know, cheaper than the, you know, than the value meal with the extra large fries is only half of it because there is also um, a habit that we've formed. You know, people have come to prefer foods that are high in salt, high in sodium, high in sugar, um, high in fat. And there's some, there's some biological reasons that we're kind of predisposed to develop those preferences. So I think, I mean, not to, um, rain on your parade, but I think that changing food <laughs> policy and, you know, trying to attack this at an economic angle is really worth pursuing. It's probably not going to be the entire solution because in a way uh, we have really trained our brains to respond to certain stimulus and um, it's going to be hard. I, you know, quite frankly, I don't want to be pessimistic about it, but I think it's hard to get people to shift from those dietary patterns even if you make it cheaper because there's some pretty heavy duty just preferences involved. You know, you absolutely. Know taste that food, um, and you get used to it. So we also have to change habits. But to to answer the question you actually asked, um, yeah, it, it seems so simple where we sit to say, why doesn't our government subsidize healthy food instead of unhealthy food? That's just a no brainer. Um, and I I do think that that's a big part of the problem. But I don't want to underestimate how complex this problem has gotten and how many you know deep roots it has into various sectors of people's well-being. You know, this all kind of came about as a way to support what used to be the primary profession in America, which was um, agricultural workers, farmers. That's how most people in this country used to make their living. And so I guess it made sense at one point, you know, for the government to support those, um, those farmers, you know, with policies that helps them uh, weather changes in market price and natural weather problems. Um, so, it, you know, it's one of those things where it could be that each decision in this chain of events made a certain logic at the time, but now we look back on the accumulated impact of all those decisions. We look at our farm bill, we look at our subsidizing 
programs and we say, wow, this really produced some very unintended consequences, but unrolling that, um, you know, I don't want to oversimplify how difficult that is. I do wish that our um, lawmakers could get a little bit more uh, ambitious about solving this problem, about balancing the needs of our farmers, you know, to, to be protected, to be supported with the needs of our country to have a healthy population. I feel like they could probably do a better job. But I also um, want to be somewhat sympathetic to just like the complexities of this. I, I feel like in our world, yours and mine, Jonathan, you know, we can run around on social media saying like, oh, the farm bill and big ag and, you know, Congress is in their pockets and, um, and be really um, sort of harsh and maybe overly simplistic about what those solutions involve. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to push for them. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, uh, I mean, Monica, I think there's, there's two important points here. And one is uh, certainly agreeing with you on the, the principle of necessary and, and sufficient. So like, it seems like the economic play is necessary, but it's insufficient. Certainly, uh, cigarettes are very expensive and very taxed. People still smoke. So, so the idea that making something expensive will, will get rid of the problem certainly does not uh, solve anything. And, and certainly that's not what's being, it's not saying just make all food more expensive. That would just, <laughs> that wouldn't help anyone. Uh, but it, so this is a necessary but insufficient approach. Of course, personal responsibility comes into play. The, the question uh, that, I, that I have though is, it seems like a lot of the arguments that people on more of a policy public health level make could have and undoubtedly were made about the tobacco industry before cigarettes were thought of as, or before, let's say, cigarettes were regulated in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, cigarettes used to be advertised on television as healthy for you, and there was a Tobacco Research Institute, and Coke just founded the Sugar Research Institute, for lack of better terms. How How is this different? And, and I'm going to just caveat that with one quick thing. I think there's a false dichotomy that people make, and that's, well, you have to eat, so it's more complicated because you, you don't have to smoke. I think that's a false dichotomy because what that's really saying is we do have to breathe. That doesn't mean we have to breathe in smoke-filled air. And we do have to eat, but that doesn't mean we have to eat genetically modified grains. So we absolutely have to eat, but that doesn't mean we have to eat certain things. What are your thoughts? Well, I think you make a great point in terms of, um, you know, certain things being, you know, helpful, but not uh, the entire solution. And so we can try to, uh, you know, implement economic policies. You know, I lived in um, Germany for many years, a long time ago, uh, back during my singing career that you alluded to. And while I was there, very funny, I lived in Bavaria, which which is where they drink beer for breakfast. <laughs> Um, you just drive through the hops fields, and, and the beer in Bavaria is really, I've never quite gotten over it. It was so amazing. <laughs> but while I was there, they passed a law saying that if you were in a, um, you know, in a tavern, in a bar, there had to be a non-alcoholic beverage available that was at least as cheap as the beer. In other words, you know, they, they didn't want people ordering another beer just because it was the cheapest thing that they could order. If you wanted to have, you know, a, a, a mineral water, a sparkling water, or a juice or something instead, they didn't want that choice to be um, counter-incentivized by the price. I thought that was a very interesting, uh, you know, kind of illustration of what you're talking about. You know, we have to make the healthy choice at least, um, you know, economically viable. Uh, but I think that there's also, we have to um, change opinion. We have to, and that, I, I'm sort of encouraged by some of the things that are beginning to happen in the school system. I live in Baltimore, Maryland, which is a, um, a very urban, you know, inside the city limits, very low socioeconomic uh, average income. Our city schools are very poor and under-resourced. And, um, you know, it's just that. Well, we've all seen the wire, right? It's all true. <laughs> But there's some really exciting things going on in the Baltimore public school system where they're clearing lots in the middle of um, these blighted neighborhoods in the cities that happen to be around these poor, benighted elementary schools. And they're taking the kids out there and they're starting urban gardens. And, and they have been so creative and so loving about the way they've integrated this into the curriculum. You know, what, what, think of the things that you can teach an elementary school child in the act of growing a garden. You know, you can talk about, uh, you know, climate. You could talk about biology. You could talk about you know, all kinds of things. 
And you can also help these kids who live in neighborhoods where you buy your, your food at a convenience store because there's no grocery store within easy access. They live in food deserts. And these kids, for the first time, actually see a vegetable coming out of the ground and can get really excited about it. And how do you get a kid excited about eating a green bean? You let them grow it. Mm-hmm. You let them water it. You let them pick it. You teach them how to cook it. And it and and there's no longer any conversation about whether they want to eat that green bean. They cannot wait to eat that green bean. So I um, I see these programs um, not just the little you know pilot program that gets a little spot on the evening news you know making a difference. But I see them actually catching on and and rolling out these programs so that they're touching more and more kids. More and more kids are having this experience with their hands in the dirt. They're growing foods that are then being um, vended to the school cafeterias and distributed within their communities on uh, you know food trucks and things. I think those kinds of programs are the sort of um, what's that military thing where the battle for the hearts and minds? <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah, that, yeah. Combined with the um, you know smart economic uh, policy choices, do have the potential to to move that lever, and and I think they're starting in the right place. You know, you have to um, catch kids young before their habits are fully formed, and and kind of inculcate these experiences, these values, this appreciation, and they gotta wait for that generation to grow up. <laughs> but at least we've started, and and that actually maybe I'm. Maybe I'm Pollyanna, but that gives me hope when I see these inner city city school kids tilling their little fields and walking through their cafeteria lines and seeing the salads and knowing they grew some of that. I feel like that has the power to change things. Monica, that is such a profound story, and and I I, I think you're exactly right. And it it reminded me, I, I jotted notes down frantically while you were talking because I think it also... I'm, and I'm going to really wax philosophical here, so feel free to reel me in if I go too far off the off the hey, reservation. It's your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned kids getting their hands in the dirt, and that inspired me to think of getting getting down to earth, literally, right? Like we, especially with the youngest generation, Gen Z. There's so much in the digital world, and I again, you know, I have a day job at Microsoft, so I'm all about digital. I'm all about technology. But at the same time, there's a lot of things like in the digital realm, things are immediate, things are quick. There's a big immediate gratification play going on. And in the real world, like if you want to grow a carrot, you cannot grow a carrot in one day. There is nothing you can do to grow a carrot in one day. It takes time, and it takes patience, and it takes deliberate action. And if we can actually help people to get their hands literally dirty and to come down to earth literally and have that more intimate relationship with natural, real, analog processes, (laughs) I wonder if that can actually have a pretty profound societal change beyond just health, but even more into mental health. What do you think? I think so. I think so. Absolutely. And, And carrots are a terrible example because they do take forever to grow and you know, <laughs> when you're I know from my own little kitchen garden here and when you're working with kids I think that you know you, you pick the stuff that comes to harvest a little quicker you know radishes <laughs> that are ready in three weeks or you know uh sprouts that they can eat in three days you know just to set the hook a little bit but no I think you make a great point um that when we connect when we take our urban spaces and dedicate um, more of them to green space and then dedicate some of that green space to actually producing food. It just, um, it reconnects us to our environment. It helps us see our, our landscape, our cityscapes a little bit different as, you know, a place where, where life needs to be supported. And there is enormous um, benefits to, I mean, not everybody has, the, I have, um, you know, like a little hundred square foot garden that I've carved out of my yard that I, that I grow food in. And it has got to be the most expensive possible way to produce, you know, a, a bowl of organic lettuce in the world. I mean, I could, and, and the most time consuming. And the reason I do it anyway, I mean, we have great farmer's markets. I can go down and buy organic lettuce for less than what I spend on, you know, garden toys. But the reason I do it anyway is because the time that I spend out there, it, it's, it's great stress relief. It's great physical, you know, activity. I'm out in the sunshine getting my vitamin D and, um, I, I see my neighbors, you know, because I'm out there on the weekends poking around in my garden. And when they walk by with their dogs or their babies, they stop to see, to chat. You know, it connects me to my community in all kinds of ways that are uh, sort of tangential, but central to that experience. So 
Okay, so I'm a yuppie, and I have a little kitchen garden here, um, and and I want to make sure that we don't make this into an elitist exercise. And that's why I keep coming back to these kids, you know, when they're out in their neighborhoods um, next to their schools tilling their little fields, the people in those communities that live around those schools see those little people and see what they're doing and see those little plants, and they're reminded too, okay, we live in a maybe in, you know, sort of a blighted urban neighborhood, but there's life here, and there's community here, and there's there's young things, living things to be nurtured, whether it's a bean plant or a kindergartner. Um, I think it does bring communities together. But wow, now, you, now you've got us both sounding awfully philosophical. Oh, well, well, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's get Alice Waters on the line. <laughs> well, no, let's, let's, let's actually keep it going because I – what what you were just talking there, it, it inspired, uh, circling back to what we talked about earlier about big levers. And when we talk about health on a more macro perspective in terms of the individual, like we're not talking about whether you have six-pack abs, we're just talking about whether or not you are happy. The It seems <laughs> like this, really this relationship with food and understanding and enjoying food, uh, again, there is a almost a there is a different relationship. For example, someone goes through a drive through at McDonald's and unconsciously shoves a Big Mac in their mouth while they're driving. That is a very different relationship with food than sitting down and consciously chewing food. And in some ways, I, again, I'm going way off the plantation here, but I think it's, it's analogous to going to a bar, having a one-night stand versus – nurturing a deep, meaningful relationship with another person. That deep, meaningful relationship with food, forget about from a, uh, a biological nutrition perspective, I think maybe we've lost just, just a, a lever in terms of just overall happiness with life. And I, maybe I went a little far out there, but what do you think? Well, I think that we also have to remember that there are that it's a luxury to have that time and that space to develop and nurture that relationship. And that um, it's possible to make excuses for, you know, uh, taking the easy road out. But I do have a lot of sympathy for parents who are working, who it's very difficult for them. You know, I see them sometimes uh, heading into the grocery store in the morning and I can tell they're at the end of their overnight shift, but they got to get the grocery shopping done. They're, they're exhausted, whatever. They've got four kids in tow you know, finding time to shop, finding time to prepare foods and cook foods and, um, you know, can be challenging depending on what people have going on in their lives. And so um, that, that I think is uh, there, it gets a little, we can get all romantic about this um, relationship with the earth and getting our hands dirty and, you know, cultivating a more nurturing relationship to what we eat. But, you know, uh, you have to have the time and the the energy, the mental and physical energy to do that. So, you know, I think now we really get far afield. If we start talking about, okay, we need to reform our, you know, childcare and maternity leave, you know, (laughs) to make that possible, but. Absolutely. Well, what do you think, for example, again, I think there are sometimes there is a, it's another, it's a false dichotomy. It's like health is difficult or eating healthful foods is difficult and being unhealthy is simple. Whereas for example, a, overweight child will have more difficulty in their everyday functioning. Just think about the social ostracism. Like even if you, even if a child were to smoke cigarettes, like they wouldn't have a hard time getting a date to the prom. They wouldn't be mocked continuously. So I I think sometimes we've just got to say where do like life isn't necessarily easy. But, you know, you're an economist, and so you you understand how difficult it is to get people to delay gratification, how much people discount um, both rewards and penalties when they're in the future, and how hard it is for us to weigh, you know, an immediate reward against a future penalty. And and so, you know, and with um, eating behaviors, it doesn't ever seem like the, you know, the 500 calories I'm about to stuff in my face right now are directly responsible for the misery I feel tomorrow on the playground or in 10 years when I'm sitting home at the prom, you know, it's just human nature. That's tough. And, and also, um, even if eating healthy can theoretically be just as easy or, or just as efficient as eating unhealthy, you know, changing behaviors is hard. Changing culture is hard. Mm. Uh, and, and that's, you know, part of what I think we can do in the school system uh, to 
to, to help build in, you know, to, to help make the, the cultural shift, you know, at the very early level. But there was something you said um, a couple of minutes ago that I thought made sort of an interesting pivot. You were talking about um, it's not just about having six-pack abs, it's about being happy. And that leads me to another kind of a topic that I often have, and, and this is now kind of pivoting back to our 1%, the, the folks who are hanging on our every word and, you know, looking up the the, the omega-6, omega-3 ratio of every nut to the fact that, <laughs> that um, they too can, uh, can get to the point where the pursuit of health becomes at the expense of balanced, harmonious, you know, relationships and, and life and and I think that that's like the other um, the other end of the extreme where extreme um, focus on nutrition can start to be a little bit of an impediment to a balanced, healthy life. And there's a um, colleague of mine who's over on your coast, actually not too far from you, Yoni Friedhoff. He's up in Vancouver and he has a great quote. Oh, I think we, I said this to you once before and you said, oh, that's a great quote. Can I quote you on it? And I was like, no, you have to quote Yoni on this. But <laughs> You know, the goal here is not to have a perfect diet or even a perfect body, but to live the healthiest life that we can enjoy living. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think that that's good for uh, for those of us who are, are sort of involved in the higher reaches of this conversation to remember that, yeah, you can't spend all your time obsessing about this. You do have to um, remember to that, that food is more than just fuel. We want it to nourish healthy bodies, but you know, it's also part of the way we interact with people and the world. And it's okay to, to enjoy things and to, um, to go ahead and and let yourself off the hook every once in a while and eat something just because you love it or because it's a special occasion, as, as long as that's in balance with, you know, your other goals. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's nothing, uh, nothing quite like wanting something at the exclusion of everything else in your life to, to make you unhappy. It's a, it's a, it's a term uh, called paradoxical intention, which not to get again now too psychological, but if you're getting ready to speak publicly and you're nervous, the best way to make yourself more nervous is to try to become less nervous because like, think about how nervous you are and try to force yourself to not be nervous. You'll become more nervous. Or maybe another example, let's say you're sleeping, you're laying in bed at night, you can't fall asleep. Think about how you can't fall asleep and consciously try to fall asleep. You will not fall asleep. <laughs> so sometimes the, the harder we try to achieve something, it can actually work against us. And it gets back to a Henry David Thoreau quote, which I'm going to butcher, but it's something along the lines of if you want to be happy, don't directly pursue happiness. Rather, pursue something else meaningful and and happiness will land on your shoulder much like a Mm -hmm. butterfly when if you try to chase a butterfly it will fly away from you but if you just sit there calmly the butterfly will land on your shoulder so we are all about philosophy and psychology in this podcast i know we're going to be off topic for the entire thing but you know i think another way of of uh keeping that in that truth in mind that you just expressed, Jonathan, is that, you know, it can be fun to, you know, follow our passions, but that it's important, especially when we're zooming in, to remember to to go back to the wide angle. And it's the whole forest and trees thing. Um, and uh, um, those of us who spend a lot of time examining individual trees need to make it a, pro- a, a, a priority, you know, once a day or, you know, once an hour or something to step back and reframe it in terms of the larger perspective so that we can uh, not lose ourselves um, that concentration is fun, but perspective is also really important. Couldn't have said it any better myself, Monica. And uh, what's, what's next for you? This is, I mean, this podcast just shows Monica is a wealth of information folks. So please check her out. And I, I know you've got a bunch of new stuff coming out, Monica, what's next for you? Uh, oh, well, it's such a luxury to be able to kind of just sit back and talk, like you say, sort of, uh, uh, from a high, um, sort of conceptual level. But when I when we finish up here, I'm going to dig back into sort of my weekly pile uh, of uh, answering listener questions, recording this week's podcast, um, have some uh, fun speaking engagements coming up, um, working with uh, um, researchers on various projects. So it's it's always just um, it, it's it's always just a, huge, a wide mix of, of projects. But you know, it all comes back to you know what can we what can we understand about food that can make us healthier and happier? Um, And how can we, uh, one of the things that I love so much about our era, yours and mine of digital publishing is that it's, um, 
it, it's so easy to have a conversation, you know, and I wrote my first book long before Twitter and, and uh, podcasting and blogging. And it was such a one-way conversation. You know, I thought about something I wanted to talk about. I did a bunch of research. I spent a year writing it. And eight months later, it finally came out in print. And, you know, who knows when anybody thought of it. Um, it was kind of lonely. And <laughs> now, you know, with the way that we uh, create and distribute content, content through blog posts, through podcasts, through, you know, digital and eBooks. Um, it feels so much more like a, a lifetime conversation. You know, if I uh, talk about something on a, on a podcast by the end of the day, I already know, you know, what people thought or, uh, you know, an, an alternate position or, you know, great conversation got launched. And, you know, that's just one of the um, ways in which I really enjoy uh, the era that we're in right now. Um, and so it makes it hard to answer that question, Jonathan, because I never quite know what's coming, you know, around the next bend. Um, and it's just that's what makes it fun to get up every morning to see what what each day brings. I love it. Well, folks, if you want to engage in that wonderful conversation with Monica, she's definitely easy to find when you're checking out your Smarter Science of Slim podcast. You'll notice another podcast that is consistently at the very top of your screen. That is the Nutrition Diva podcast. And that is Monica. She is the nutrition diva and you can find her on social media with the same tag. You can also find her on her website, which is a hub for all things Monica related. And that is nutrition over easy.com. All sorts of, again, podcasts, blog posts, books, good stuff in general. Monica, thank you so much for all that you do and for the wonderful insights today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Jonathan. I always enjoy our conversations. I look forward to the next one. Awesome. Thank you so much. And listeners, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed today's show as much I, as I did. I'm so excited I'm getting tongue-tied. <laughs> In fact, remember, this week and every week after, eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Talk with you soon.